What Was It? by Fitz James O'Brien. It is, I confess, with considerable diffidence that I approach the strange narrative which I am about to relate. The events which I propose detailing are of so extraordinary a character that I am quite prepared to meet with an unusual amount of incredulity and scorn. I accept all such beforehand. I have, I trust, the literary courage to face unbelief. I have, after mature consideration, resolved to narrate, in as simple and straightforward a manner as I can compass, some facts that passed under my observation in the month of July last, and which in the annals of the mysteries of physical science are wholly unparalleled. I live at number 26th Street in New York. The house is, in some respects, a curious one. It has enjoyed for the last two years the reputation of being haunted. It is a large and stately residence, surrounded by what was once a garden, but which is now only a green enclosure used for bleaching clothes. The dry basin of what has been a fountain and a few fruit trees, ragged and unpruned, indicate that this spot in past days was a pleasant shady retreat, filled with fruits and flowers and the sweet murmur of waters. The house is very spacious. A hall of noble size leads to a large spiral staircase winding through its center, while the various apartments are of imposing dimensions. It was built some 15 or 20 years since by Mr. A, the well-known New York merchant, who five years ago threw the commercial world into convulsions by a stupendous bank fraud. Mr. A, as everyone knows, escaped to Europe and died not long after of a broken heart. Almost immediately after the news of his decease reached this country and was verified, the report spread in 26th Street that number was haunted. Legal measures had dispossessed the widow of its former owner, and it was inhabited merely by a caretaker and his wife, placed there by the house agent in whose hands it had passed for purposes of renting or sale. These people declared that they were troubled with unnatural noises. Doors were opened without any visible agency. The remnants of furniture scattered through the various rooms were during the night piled one upon the other by unknown hands. Invisible feet passed up and down the stairs in broad daylight, accompanied by the rustle of unseen silk dresses and the gliding of viewless hands along the massive balusters. The caretaker and his wife declared they would live there no longer. The house agent laughed, dismissed them, and put others in their place. The noises and supernatural manifestations continued. The neighborhood caught up the story and the house remained untenanted for three years. Several persons negotiated for it, but somehow, always before the bargain was closed, they heard the unpleasant rumors and declined to treat any further. It was in this state of things that my landlady, who at that time kept a boarding house in Bleecker Street, and who wished to move further uptown, conceived the bold idea of renting number 26th Street. Happening to have in her house rather a plucky and philosophical set of boarders, she laid her scheme before us, stating candidly everything she had heard respecting the ghostly qualities of the establishment to which she wished to remove us. With the exception of two timid persons, a sea captain and a returned Californian, who immediately gave notice that they would leave. All of Mrs. Moffat's guests declared that they would accompany her in her chivalric incursion into the abode of spirits. Our removal was effected in the month of May, and we were charmed with our new residence. The portion of 26th Street where our house is situated between 7th and 8th Avenues is one of the pleasantest localities in New York. The gardens back of the houses, running down nearly to the Hudson, form in the summertime a perfect avenue of verdure. The air is pure and invigorating, sweeping as it does straight across the river from the Weehawken Heights, and even the ragged garden which surrounded the house, although displaying on washing days rather too much clothesline, still gave us a piece of greensward to look at and a cool retreat in the summer evenings, where we smoked our cigars in the dusk and watched the fireflies flashing their dark lanterns in the long grass. Of course, we had no sooner established ourselves at number then we began to expect the ghosts. We absolutely awaited their advent with eagerness. Our dinner conversation was supernatural. One of the boarders who had purchased Mrs. Crow's Night Sight of Nature for his own private delectation was regarded as a public enemy by the entire household for not having bought 20 copies. The man led a life of supreme wretchedness while he was reading this volume. A system of espionage was established, of which he was the victim. If he unconsciously laid the book down for an instant and left the room, it was immediately seized and read aloud in secret places to a select few. I found myself a person of immense importance, it having leaked out that I was tolerably well versed in the history of supernaturalism, 
and had once written a story the foundation of which was a ghost. If a table or a wainscot panel happened to warp when we were assembled in the large drawing room, there was an instant silence, and everyone was prepared for an immediate clanking of chains and a spectral form. After a month of psychological excitement, it was with the utmost dissatisfaction that we were forced to acknowledge that nothing in the remotest degree approaching the supernatural had manifested itself. Once the black butler asseverated that his candle had been blown out by some invisible agency while he was undressing himself for the night. But as I had more than once discovered this colored gentleman in a condition when one candle must have appeared to him like two, I thought it possible that, by going a step further in his potations, he might have reversed this phenomenon and seen no candle at all where he ought to have beheld one.